today and we're taking apart one of the goodies that I found in the trash last summer. And I must say, despite being almost a piece of history, this is an apparatus just as useful today as it was in the mid-70s when this thing first came out. I'm talking about the Polaron E51 Zero Zero. It was the follow-up to the E50 Zero Zero, which was one of the first commercial sputtering units for scanning electron microscopes. For those of you that are not aware, in order for something to be viewed on an electron microscope, the specimen needs to be conducted in order for the specimen to emit x-rays when struck by an electron or have the electron backscatter. But if your specimen is not conducted, then what? Well, then you need a SEM coater in order to coat your specimen with a very thin layer of conductive metal. Some of the more common metals are the rather non-oxidizing ones like platinum, palladium or gold. But also silver, copper and nickel are quite common. In this one, the sputtering target, as they are called, is a nickel ring cold pressed onto a larger brass ring that I presume acts as a heat sink. This is then suspended by three PTFE flathead bolts inside a mild steel casing. And by now it should be clear that one of the drawbacks of the E51 is the limited run time. Modern units often have some form of active cooling in order to extend the run time, but this one has done fine without it so far. And as long as its run time is kept to a few minutes, I think it will be fine for many years to come. O-rings, however, they don't last forever. And part of the reason I'm taking part of the apparatus is to give the O-rings an overhaul that is long overdue. However, for those hoping to see the unit in action, I will sadly disappoint you. I'm currently in a bit of a vacuum pump oil drought. Vacuum pump abuse has left me with only one barely functional single stage out of the three pumps I currently own. So until I strike oil, no sputtering. But when I do, I'm sure it will show up in a later video. For now we shall be content with having a look at the E51. And we start with the front panel, and we can clearly see that this is a unit so simple your grandma could operate it. It even has a kitchen timer, like for real. That is a mechanical timer used to switch the high voltage. Right underneath we have the function selection, where off turns everything off. If you set it to pump, a relay will switch on anything connected to the power plug in the back. Usually that will be your pump. You then start pumping down the chamber to suitable pressure for flushing the system with a noble gas, usually argon. There's a small needle valve that connects the argon supply to the chamber, and the pressure is read off in tours on this analog display. The next function is set high T, or high tension, which means high voltage at a low current, for those unfamiliar with the term. Typical values for this one is about 2.5 kilovolts at about 20 milliamps. The current is shown on the other display in milliamps. The last function is the timer and it activates the unit for the set amount of time. According to the manual of the E51, a gold coating under argon at 2.5 kV would deposit a layer according to x equals 7.5 times i times t where T is the time in minutes and I is the current in milliamps and X is the thickness of the deposit delay in ohms and since we're not pronouncing that again we simply call it tenths of a nanometer now let's have a look at the chamber the chamber is open from the top and we have an o-ring fitting in this screw that fits over the glass window the small hole has an air inlet and a big one would fit the mount for the magnetron this mount is sort of curious, they could have gone for a fixed HD feed through and an internally adjustable bed. Because despite how it looks, under the vacuum, there is a plastic clip that wedges the high tension feed through in place, so you can't do any adjustments during sputtering. It does however save a bit of room, and it makes it really easy to adjust the target height before pumping. The main downside is the fucking hole in the vacuum chamber. Because the only seal to the shaft going through is this o-ring inside the hole. And because the magnetron is often adjusted, this o-ring wears down really fast. And will have to be replaced quite often. The other ones don't move, and the only problem is that they eventually dry up and crack. A bit of the occasional vacuum grease will help a lot to prolong the life expectancies. 
I just use over the counter silicon grease that I bake in my vacuum to desecrate them. I would leave the tube at 70 degrees Celsius for however long it needs for the pressure to go way below 8 to 100 tall area, typical of moisture. After that, it's usually good to anywhere from 10 to the minus 3 to the minus 6 thaws, depending on grease. But be aware, desecrators are the destroyers of vacuum pumps, and unless you have a diaphragm pump, a trap is pretty much a must. And even then, there's always the chance that something will go through and mess up the pump boy, as I got the experience recently when trying to bake 3D printable plastics in order to reduce the outgassing in vacuum applications. Here, I'm removing the glass window and the collar, and taking them apart to get the o-ring between them. And why it's going from the collar off of the specimen thermocouple and Pelkia cooler, and as cooling is the main difference between the E51 and its precursor the E50, that did not have a specimen cooling, or substrate cooling. With the o-rings and specimen holder removed, the inside surfaces were cleaned using pure isopropyl alcohol with lint-free cloth. It's important to let the parts dry properly before reassembling because even a small amount of moisture will have severe effect on the pump down time for the chamber. The o-rings were greased up and set aside on a paper towel. Now I removed the back panel so we can have a look inside, but before that we have the coupling for the pump. It's simply a copper tube that sticks out the back, but I've ghettoed an adapter to have it mate with quick flanges because K flanges are brilliant and it's like Legos of high vacuum. The centering is aligned and the mating ends and you just throw in the clamp and you're done. Now, if we remove the temperature control unit, we can follow the vacuum outlet and see how the base is connected. Inside here we have two additional connectors, two that goes to the Neva valve in the front and to the gas intake here. The other one is a piranha gauge in order to measure the pressure. The piranha gauge achieves this by looking at the rate of power dissipation from the resistor that is suspended in a vacuum. As the pressure goes down, the ability for the gas to remove heat from the resistor also decreases, so you can make an indirect measure of the pressure. Um, it's sort of oversimplifying, but I have a broken piranha gauge that I've considered to fix up. If there's any interest, I could maybe do a video of it. On the left here, we see the transformer that steps up the voltage, and on top we can see the diodes for rectifying high voltage output. I don't know how well you can see it, but here we have a tiny variac that adjusts the input to the transformer. The variac is a knob on the front panel, if that's not clear, and that's how the voltage is adjusted. The high voltage then goes to the magnetron, where the sputtering gas is ionized and by swirling the ionized sputtering gas around in the magnetic field, it slams into the sputtering target and showers a substrate or specimen with the target metal. Now, this image was from the product manual, and I'll leave a link to it in the video description for the interested viewer, or those of you perhaps making a magnetron yourself, because this is a well-documented apparatus with circuit diagrams and all, from time before these things got complicated and it should be a great help and inspiration for those of you thinking about the DIY magnetron sputtering unit. However, I feel that we've come to the point where this unit is about as tore down as I wanted it. And I sort of just made this video in order to get in the habit of making videos and also to fill time while waiting for part 3 of the pH meter where I'll tell you more about the great printer clog 1617. But until then, or maybe next filler. Have a great one, and thanks for watching.